Thank you for that opening. Oh, hey, you're welcome. <laughs> now I'll, I'll try to go off the rail a little bit. First of all, I, I'm going to ask you to participate with me in a couple things. Do you have anybody who likes not participating? You've been kind of quiet. Yeah. Um, I, I've, been, I've been very interested a long time with uh, the idea of storytelling, but uh, I should also add that my degrees in this field um, completely unqualified to talk about technology. I have bachelor's and master's in geology and, and an unfinished PhD that we'll never get. So I focused my time in school on learning a science. So I wanted to shift my usual talk about this to sort of try to get at possibility what role storytelling has in terms of the way we communicate science. So the picture's not really dark here, but when I start my class, I usually like to ask my students, instead of defining what storytelling is, I kind of ask them what they think of when I say the word storytelling. So help me out. What, what comes to mind when I say storytelling? Family. Family. That's Bedtime. a good one. Story, story. Bedtime stories, right? People Boys. reading you bedtime stories? Yeah. Anybody else? Movies. Movies, yeah. Storytelling. Yeah. Books. Novels. Books. Do you guys do campfires on the beach here? That sort of thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the usual connotation that comes up. Um, but also, a lot of people think, uh, first of all, like story time, um, since Antonio told me that most of the people here were from the science and technology areas, that's the stuff they do over in the humanities. That's the fun stuff, or the silly stuff. Or maybe that's the stuff that they do only in elementary school. And the question is, um, is there a place, again, for storytelling in scientists? So I don't have the answer, so I'll ask the question. <laughs> but this guy, anybody know this is this? Famous. Rich, I come. Richard Feynman. Did, did he know something about storytelling? Oh <laughs> Richard Feynman. Um, not only the way he approached his teaching in terms of using parallel metaphor, but his own pursuits. He was a musician, right? Yep. And uh, what was that book he wrote about going to Tuva to, to seek out? I read oh, this the book. Throat Singers? Yeah, The Throat Singers. Yeah. So he's very interested in his field of physics, but also in the broader place that that science met. And I'm pretty sure he was a storytelling. So uh, Stephen Jay Gould, he actually appeared as a character on The Simpsons. He didn't actually appear on The Simpsons. But you know, as someone, when I was first studying, um, got interested in geology, I read a lot of stuff that Stephen Jay Gould wrote. And he always wrote in a way that was approachable. I mean, he used metaphors from cooking, and he did a lot from baseball. He was a, a huge baseball fan. And he got his inspiration. This is a story. As a kid, he went to the Natural History Museum in New York and saw the, uh, the Tyrannosaurus, and he got scared. And that sparked his entry into science. So in a way, uh, a lot of people in science generally have this entree into the field. Like, what is the story that people got their interest um, in science? Uh, a colleague of mine uh, named Ruben Puentador, really brilliant. I actually stole a good number of ideas from him. Um, had this great way uh, statement. It says, um, one of the words is clipped there. One of the best ways to understand, understand something is to create a story about it. So sometimes you think a story is something you make up, like you fabricate a story, or it's a fairy tale. But if you're trying to understand something in a way to write a story about it, you've got to understand its background, its context, its history, what's true or what it's false. So it's a great way to get into a subject. So for a little science story, and I, I don't know how to pronounce, is it Kekulé? Yeah. Yeah, Kekulé? Yeah. What do you do? What is he famous for? Uh, the destruction of benzene. Yeah, Ooh. famous for discovering the benzene ring. He, he also had the other one that was another chain uh, structure that, that he figured out. This great story. He got uh, recognition in his career, and then like 25 or 30 years later, he was being honored for all his work. And he was asked what the inspiration was uh, for this. And he actually said that he had a dream of a tail eating its snake. <laughs> And that's how he got the idea for taking the structure of the benzene and wrapping it in a ring. I mean, and this will be in textbooks, it's in Wikipedia. This is like the common knowledge of how this, and it's a great story, right? We get inspired by the things around us. It's a metaphor that drives us to discovery. I, I did find some people have recently been like combing through that history and they think it's a little bit stretched. Um, one thing, uh, because this great book that, that Gardner turned me on to, Stephen Johnson's mm -hmm. Where Good Ideas Come mm -hmm. From, is what happens in science. People in parallel discover the same thing. And there are scientists at the same time who propose 
the same benzene ring structure. So there's a sort of play about the stories. Again, um, they're useful as a metaphor, and it probably will help you remember the benzene ring. I remember a group of nerds in my high school class. They called the they had a group they called themselves the benzene ring. So like the, the chemistry nerd gang. Um, well, that's why my uh, my top of my slides are getting clipped. So uh, in terms of digital storytelling, which is my interest for the last couple of years, is what happens when we take the old oral tradition and use uh, modern digital technology to talk about it, not only just as sort of a way, new way to tell a story, put in a video, but the way the web allows us to do stories in ways that weren't possible before. So uh, Brian wrote this book called The New Digital, digital Storytelling, and it's for me, it's the Bible for, for this topic. He's got great example from how um, games can be used and augmented reality games and all kinds of bits of narrative fiction, etc. So now a little exercise. Um, I like to do a lot with just simple stories that may start with a picture. So since I was a geologist, I picked a picture of a rock. Uh, this is from taken out in the Mojave Desert. There's these things known as the sailing rocks. They're really large. Now one thing we used to do in geology is always have something there for scale, so you know how big it is. So usually there's like a lens cap next to it. Um, so, but these rocks are fairly big. And it's a mystery as how they move. They literally move across the desert playa floor and leave these race tracks behind them. And it's stumping people. They don't have the explanation. So one story is how it happened story, right? What could it be? Could have to do with some forces uh, of tectonic nature maybe, or freeze thaw, or something with just low angles of slope and gravity. So that's one important story. And that's the story we, we get to a lot in science. We want to actually explain how things happen. And we build it upon observation and experiments and things that can be reinterpreted. But we could also imagine a story. Maybe it was aliens. <laughs> Maybe it was drunk college students. <laughs> so that's another story. But you can go even farther. Um, what is the rock story? What if we gave the rock a personality? <laughs> It didn't like where it was living, and it picked up and moved itself. And when I did this last week for uh, another group, they came up with a couple versions that I hadn't even thought of. They thought about, what about the, the, the soil story? It was just sitting there minding its own business, and it got run over by the spot. <laughs> we can go a long way with a single picture um, with just our imagination. So there's lots of ways we can use pictures. All right, now, this is where it gets scary. I'm going to ask for some help here in terms of uh, improv. Does anybody here like experience in doing improv? You work in clubs anywhere? Anybody? You good? Um, I don't either. <laughs> but in a way, we improv all the time. We improv a lot of times when we get up here and speak. We improv socially when we have conversations. It's not like we meet up for lunch and we have this scripted conversation. Our entire lunch conversation was improvised. It happened and it was this exchange between us. I think the, the, the act and the way improv is taught, and I've never actually gone through one of those schools, has a lot to be done for the ways that we can learn to be better communicators. And a lot of it happens because it happens. We go to these conferences, we go to these meetings, and you get some up there and goes, for my first point, I'm going to read you my hypothesis. <laughs> and they read you their, their PowerPoint slides. And we all laugh about that, but people do it all the time. I don't know what's wrong with them. So I think we can get to be better um, communicators if we can do some things with improv. So what I like to do is I like to build web tools that kind of do some things that I think might be interesting. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're my, my own sort of uh, curiosity. So I created a site called Pecha Flickr. Are you familiar with the presentation format called Pechachka or? Pechacucha. Yeah, I would say Pechacucha, and everybody says that's wrong. But I think it should be pronounced Pechacucha. It doesn't even look like that. So that arose in Japan because a group of architects got tired of going to these boring meetings were architects, so I guess they're really bad presenters, got up and went on, droned on for hours about their PowerPoint and reading their PowerPoint slides. And they said, we got an idea for a format that's going to move it along really quick. So in Pecha, Pechachka, whatever, Pecha Kucha format, you only get, you get 20 slides in your presentation. Six minutes. And each one, yeah, you know this, have you done this? Yeah. Okay, nice. well, you might be my first volunteer. <laughs> so, um, oh. <laughs> And then each one is on the screen for 20 seconds. So it's six minutes and 40 seconds. 
First of all, what it means is you get to the presentations quickly. But as a presenter, you can't just walk on and sort of wing it and get through like three quarters of your slide deck and then realize you've got 90 more <laughs> slides to go. You have to practice and you have to rehearse. And also, it kind of changes um, the, the feeling of the electricity in the room. So that was out there. And then I've done a couple things with uh, doing some interactive sites that pull images from Flickr. So I can't say, actually someone asked me if it was possible to do this, to mix Pecha Kucha up with this other thing that people do at conferences called, was it Battle Decks? Or, um, yeah, right. Yeah, and it started at one of the South by Southwest conferences where for kind of to see how people could do without knowing anything or how they could improvise, they would prepare a slide deck with these random images that were just crazy things. And if you volunteered to do it, you would have to try to get up and do a coherent talk off of these images you've never seen before. Kind of, kind of scary. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and Jim, and you guys did it at Faculty Academy a couple yeah, times. Fun. You did it. Yeah. I, did. I, I, did I did it at Baylor once too. Oh, nice. Well, Jim may get a chance to do it. So <laughs> the idea of this site is to marry those two things again. So what I've created is, is a site where you can put any uh, tag or keyword in here, and it's going to randomly pull images from Flickr, the photo sharing site, and it's going to put them up there for a fixed amount of time and we get to sort of see how well people can do with their improv. So rather than, it, it's, it's hard if you're the person doing it. So what I found is kind of interesting, if I could get maybe two, three people who'd be willing to join me in an improv talk about a topic you're raising. All right, what's your name? Lewis. Help me out. Lewis. Lewis, all right, come on up, Lewis. Okay. You, you have to come up here. Can I do it over here? <laughs> you can do it from there. You can do it from there. It's not a problem. We want to see you, Lewis. All in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All in. <laughs> All in. <laughs> You're away from the camera. All right. Lewis. Lewis. Oops. That's not the one I want. Who else is going to be in on this? Am I going to call on? You want to be on this, right? No. What's your name? Nidia. Nidia. Oh, boy. I'm terrible. At names. <laughs> one more time. Nidia. Nidia? Okay, you're going to be number two, right? <laughs> Come on. Okay. I guarantee you, you'll have fun. <laughs> I, but I won't force you. Yeah. Will you do this? No. Okay, no. Who's, who's going to help me out? Okay, I'll help you. Antonio and, and Gardner. You want to help? Oh, go. go. What's your name? Javier. Javier. Javier, okay. So Javier, Luis, Antonio, and me. I will start off to, to give you an idea of what's going to happen. So, but first we need a topic for what we're gonna be talking about here. So help me out, think of a word as a descriptive tag that's gonna pull up images from Flickr that might be interesting or perhaps topical. That is nomad. Nomad? Snowman. Snowman, like in Puerto Rico, like how we talked yeah. about it. <laughs> Javier, Lewis, how do you feel about snowmen? You have any experience with snowmen? Okay. <laughs> so much the better. Another one. <laughs> okay. That's what makes it fun. We had a great time when I was in Alaska. We did gnome. G N O M E. Oh, nice. You know these pictures of these weird gnomes? Nice. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I had to do. I had three guys named Chris. <laughs> Oops, that's not it. Snowman. So what's going to happen if this works? When I click play, a new window is going to open. There's like a holding screen. And then since I'm going first. I'm going to start our talk loosely based on the image that's there, but I'm going to improvise it. And let's just see what options we're going to have. We got four people here, so we'll do we'll do eight rounds, and I'll put it on there for 15 seconds. So I actually made it so you could adjust the timing. So what's going to happen is um, I will talk for 15 seconds, and then as soon as soon as the next image comes on, I got to stop, even if I'm in mid sentence. And Javier, you're going to have to pick it up. Oh carry the train of thought, you know, continue the idea that I proposed, somehow weave in the content of the picture, and then it'll be Lois's turn and then Antonio. So each has to continue the yeah, idea of the, yeah. of the previous. We're going to pass it off to each other. And, and what relation with the images? Right. Trying to... to... You can use metaphor. I mean, the, the temptation and the natural thing to do is sort of to uh, describe it or use it as uh, very literal, but you can be metaphorical. Right. You can ignore the picture. Because sometimes they just make no sense, and you, know, you kind of just stop. You should put a little more time so that they can think. 
part but of the language. That, that's the hardest part. Uh -huh, because Do you want 20 Spanish, seconds? It would okay. be easier okay. for us. <laughs> Not for you. That's okay. fine. That's fine. Sometimes 20 seconds feels like a long time. I know, but... but that I makes think, perfect sense. Okay. And then I actually have something to follow Maybe up in Spanish we could use okay. 10 seconds. Okay. I will accept <laughs> suggestions, okay? Okay. So we're ready to go. I'm going first, then Javier, then Luis, then Antonio. And there's going to be no grades for this. Yeah. There are no grades for this. Only assessment. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just the adoration. <laughs> That's right. Our learning objective. Okay, so um, this is the holder. This is the placeholder slide. Let's get this ready. So I'm, I'm here in Puerto Rico. I'm glad we came together for the, um, the snowman convention in Puerto Rico. We got really cheap hotel rates here. I'm just setting this up, waiting for the first picture. And ironically, although we're here in the tropics with change in climate, I foresee a potential to really change the tourist industry here. And it's time we establish a regional Puerto Rican authority to create the first snowman festival in Puerto Rico. Because <laughs> the big freeze, you're up. Right, you were saying this, um, the snowman festival, it's a great idea for Puerto Rico, especially with all the snow that we're getting right now, with all the <laughs> climate change and everything. And um, you see, even the children can participate in making those dolls. <laughs> Uh, seeing that we're in the tropical now, uh, has, uh, that, um, like my fellow peer said, that now we can even combine it with the tropical too because even the birds are participating. <laughs> 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 and uh, the, the, the snowman may, the, uh, after the, a couple of issues of this festival, we may even have serial killers as no <laughs> <laughs> the, Particularly the previous one seemed to me like a, a serial killer. <laughs> but, okay. But you know, we should just like not worry about serial killers and just like look to the sky <laughs> and really appreciate the fact that we can have snow in Puerto Rico. I think it's the dawn of a, a probably a whole new industry here. <laughs> and you could be ahead of this trend if you prepare now and get things such as jackets, <laughs> <laughs> boots, and other right app apparel. But at the same time you could be at a lake, although it seems it's not freezing yet, but yeah. Dressed up as a snowman. <laughs> nice. Uh, Okay, seeing now, seeing how now uh, is everything is white. Now even the models are joining in with the snowman. <laughs> they are now more cooler. Now they are appearing on TV. Hi. And then the beauty contest uh, of the previous slide will transform in a, in a very nice love story between two snow men and women or no persons. <laughs> and that's it. And uh, they lived happily forever. In Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico. Now I just want to ask a few things. Um, did you notice like anything change in the room when that started? Things got relaxed. Yeah. 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 yeah, and and you were probably glad you didn't do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I I have seen um, in pro competitions between countries here right. in Puerto Rico, yeah. and they're a lot of fun to it's watch. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and for Javier and Luis, like like how is it for you in terms of like where, where your mind was at in terms of do you think your mind was uh, working differently than you do sitting there just listening to me? I don't know. Like uh, I was, well, when I was watching the his picture, I was uh, thinking of something of that too. Uh, so I didn't expect what mine would look like. So I, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> but a little bit different than when like you're just sitting in class taking notes, right? Yeah. My mind was racing. <laughs> <laughs> Were you panicked? Were you worried? At first, yeah. I was a, I was the first one, so I was like a little bit worried. But I was just thinking about what you were saying, like really listening and well, taking the picture mm. in, and it was good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, there's got to be something more intense going on. Again, I'm not a, a cognitive scientist, 
I don't even pretend to be one. But I'm thinking like, you're thinking about this whole context, you're looking at the image, you're probably like watching people around the room to see how they're reacting. I think there's a lot going on in the head in this exercise. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is kind of, it's a fun thing, it's silly. It'd be, I think, great for an icebreaker or sort of a, a thing in, and probably in like any communication class, a speech class. And you mentioned the Spanish. I had actually asked some colleagues who, um, you know, if they could see a potential use for this. And my friend Tom Conaway said, a faculty member at his college who teaches Spanish says, uh, he puts um, a word on there like clothes and he asks the students to practice in Spanish. Um, they're conversational and to have to do that improv um, should help them be able to, to work better in terms of being able to, to, to speak in Spanish. And I don't know, there may be other things, but I enjoy doing it. You guys were great. So in, in science, of course, the thing is, we should have something important to say. That's why we communicate. That's the whole field of communications. So I'm going to wax a little bit about what works in terms of storytelling. So movies are very effective. Hollywood has come up with this great formula for how to create things that sort of help us escape, go away, we go on an adventure. Uh, so things like, and you probably won't get all the sound, but I will just play a little bit. Disney, Pixar, big names grab our attention. Thematic music. you with the rest of this <laughs> but movie I mean first of all they're very bright in this case this one they're fast-paced things are cutting we got the loud music we've got unusual actors this is all designed to sort of grab our attention and that's what movies do very well but really for the most part in terms of entertainment do movies really communicate much they do right yeah sometimes but sometimes pure entertainment they can be yeah. magic. Them magic. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, whether they're good or not is another question. <laughs> but Monsters, Inc., is that really... I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So I kind of project whether it's possible in terms of something more academic or more science, if we can borrow some of the techniques that work in movies to grab our attention to sort of explain something. And typically when we communicate in, in our fields, we're very clear. We tell them in the front what we're gonna tell them, we tell them the conclusion, we go through a long litany of our background, and then we actually do something, and it's just kind of like, there's no, there's no arc to the plot. Uh, this is a movie I found uh, on the internet that actually shows the results of a science explanation. But look at the, um, the film style, you'll see the same kind of cuts, You'll see use of shallow depth of field, and we don't know what's going on uh, in this movie. So it might be a cooking show. Let's see what you do. <laughs> it might be a horror movie. Yeah. So yeah, it, it looks like uh, making juice, right? The sound is really good. Oh wait, there's a diagram. It's a bomb. That's not, <laughs> that's not any cooking uh, things I've seen before. Um, Ouch. Uh, Measuring something. Bolts. If we need more oranges. A battery. We're building a battery. Have you seen this one before? Oh, I've, no. seen that. <laughs> I've seen Breaking Bad. <laughs> it takes approximately 23,800 orange slices to power an iPhone. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. How many again? 2380. Wow. So John, that's beautiful. <laughs> we have to do that. Right? It might need to be verified, John. But yeah. um, first of all, I mean, it, it fits in perfectly with what Gardner was talking about, sort of a trailer. A trailer for a science experiment. I would never suggest that this is the way all scientists need to communicate, but really, I mean, scientists, especially ones who are you know, funded by grants and, and, and monies, sort of, I th think, have a debt to sort of be able to communicate their work 
to the public, but as well as something they're passionate in. If you're passionate about you know, alternate sources of power or whatever your passion is, maybe you can think about other ways to communicate it than just your typical uh, scientific papers. So the, the formula of that works really well. All my slides are clipped here. Maybe I should just finish the screen. Um, well, we have to change the projector. Oh, OK, OK. Um, but there's this thing known as the Freitag pyramid that is basically the formula for almost every Hollywood screenplay, the three-act play. So there's, there's exposition. We introduce something. There's rising action. Some things happen that, that, that get someone in trouble. They've got to figure a way to get out. So, you know, um, um, in, in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's just flying around on his plane, minding his own business. He runs into some robots, and all of a sudden he gets taken away on this adventure. There's a projection of Princess Leia. There's a big battle at the end. There's some, so, some sort of, like, uh, concluding action, and then we have denouement. So um, this sort of shape of the story, uh, Freitag, was he a psychologist? Um, he basically was interested in sort of uh, the story of drama to see if there was a pattern mm. in things that really were accepted as common stories. So um, this, this idea about the shape of the stories, for me, has been really useful because when I ask people in my class to start telling stories, they generally start like a laundry list. Well, this first I got in my car, and then there was a thing on the road, and there's just like a series of events. There's nothing to sort of build that shape of the story. So I'm going to show um, this one by Kurt Vonnegut, uh, where he explains um, the, the idea of the story having shapes. Hopefully you can hear this. She has created a body of work of startling eccentricity and universal appeal. His singular view of the world applies not just to his stories and characters, but to some of his theories as well. Uh, no reason why a simple shape of story can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. And, uh, this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Her father 
things I enjoy about Kurt Vonnegut. I mean, just the way he does that whole thing where he, he kind of takes your expectations, the BE axis, and, um, and it's brilliant. But what I like to get my students to think about is the fact that stories that they see, uh, view, and also the ones that they create need to have this shape, that it's the, sort of the amplitude and the fact that things do go up in town that drive up the interest in the story. And I, I, like, I like to wonder sometimes, they all kind of end up in the, the upper right quadrant. Um, I guess there's a couple of dark <laughs> stories that, that end up low, uh, but for the most part. So what I ask them to do when we introduce storytelling is ask them to uh, take a movie they've seen or a book they've read or anything that they're, they're uh, viewing and to draw that shape as, hey, they say it according to Kurt Vonnegut. So it gets them to think about that shape. And as they do their work in the regular semester, if they do stuff to me that's just kind of like this, I kind of refer back to this. But they seem to find it very useful. They love the video. I remember one, one girl commented on our blog, I don't know who that dude was, but he was funny. <laughs> um, there's another great video um, that I can give you the link for. Um, a different take on the shape of a story. Uh, uh, Zach is a, a neurochemist, and they've done some studies uh, to get at why stories work. And uh, they identify two emotions that trigger um, certain parts of the brain. Uh, and it's uh, the idea of someone in distress uh, that sort of gets our attention and developing a sense of empathy. And he kind of comes about a different way of showing this uh, story shape. So the shapes of a story are important. Again, a lot of times when we're doing our professional communication, this is the shape of our stories. We get pretty flat and there's no thing to really keep our interest going in the middle of that talk. Or maybe that class, I don't know, I was just thinking, maybe, maybe you could ask your students to draw the, the shape of your lecture or the shape of a class and see what kind of perspective they have on your story. I got really interested in this by this book I found uh, called Don't Be Such a Scientist. Uh, Randy Olson was a tenure track biologist at somewhere in New Hampshire and he achieved the pinnacle. He was tenured, he had it made. But he always had this dream of doing documentaries. So he did something crazy, he completely walked away from academia he went to USC and enrolled in the film school. And there he was with all these like 18 year olds who were just like starting their career. And the very first thing that happened, they had to do improv. And they had in front of the class one of those really tough acting teachers who was just yelling and screaming at people. And it was Randy's turn and she gave him the prompt that he was supposed to do in improv. And he was there thinking about what he was gonna say. And she was screaming at him, she says, Olsen, don't be such a scientist, get out of your head. <laughs> so the book is sort of his journey and again trying to transform what he learned about the reason why Hollywood movies work so well in terms of, of getting our interest and drawing our emotions like not only the, the, the head but down to the brain and into the gut and sometimes even below but um, the whole idea is that um, scientists he found really don't understand this way of communicating so he sort of took on this mission to do his documentaries which he, he did one on penguins that was moderately successful but also he kind of became a consultant and did a lot of work with scientists to get them to improve their communications. And this is where I kind of got this idea. It's, there's two things that are really important is, is arousing, getting people's attention. <coughs> but again, as scientists or academics or professionals in any field, we've got something that we want to communicate. So it's not just getting attention, which a lot of movies do, but it's delivering uh, that message. So I, I won't do this. I thought maybe we could sort of experiment with what the shape of a science story might be. I don't know if you want to play this out. <laughs> All right, so help me out. So, someone who's a teacher here or a student, like what, what's a topic you're dealing with in class right now? 
chemistry, biology. I've never done this before. <laughs> what, what, what unit are you on? What, 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 where's your, what unit is your class on right now? You're, you're Let's see. <laughs> We're discussing uh, substitutions, reactions, and organic chemistry. Okay, substitutions and reactions in organic chemistry. All right, so um, if we're introducing something we want our students to engage in in terms of that, um, so we're going to introduce, we have to have some exposition. So we have to introduce something that might be relevant to grab our interest into that topic. What, what might that, that be? Something that's? Well, some relevance of uh, uh, those types of reactions uh, in relation to the biochemical processes that occur in our cells. Okay. Okay, so we ourselves in our body. And then what could be sort of like some things that would happen in terms of action, like, you know, our bodies are going along fine doing these, uh, everything that we do. Like, what would be sort of like a, a miniature crisis or something our body might have to react to? <laughs> like maybe a bad lunch or something? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, and then, you know, at some point, our body does something, right, to deal with the situation, right? What does it do? Well, like running. Running. You you run out of energy. You run out of energy. Yeah, and then how, how do you get out of the situation? Because the hero always has to sort of like, they get presented with problems. they got to figure out how to build the spaceship mm -hmm. or how to get out of the tunnel. They've got to figure out something, how to get out of the situation of, of a bad lunch. So what might they do to treat the situation? <laughs> I'm really putting you on the spot, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really thought this out, but... Um, there might be some room to think about the way we construct uh, maybe the problems we give our students to think about. Um, I mean, in a way, you know, I don't think necessarily like uh, textbook problems really address that. There's a couple of plot twists you can do, right? You can do throw up, go to the bathroom, run. <laughs> go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. Get yourself in the hospital. Love these. Love these. Uh, another really interesting variant on the sort of shape of the stories, um, Nancy Duarte is someone who writes a lot about uh, how to do better presentations. And uh, she has this book called Resonate. And she took a bunch of very famous speeches and she analyzed them almost uh, down to the second to sort of uh, characterize what was going on in these speeches. So the, the two that she cites uh, often are uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and uh, JFK's speech when he kind of urged us to go to the moon. And she found this interesting pattern where they kept varying back and forth between this is the way things are, this is the way things could be. And there's this rhythm of going back and forth that sort of give us a shape. I mean, in these speeches, we're trying to motivate, we're trying to change things. And this pattern of going back and forth between this is how things are, this is the way things could be. And, and even down to King's speech, she's charted where he did repetition because um, he was a very rhythmic speaker, and, and, and the frequency of those repetitions uh, grew much narrower at the end, and the parts where he appealed to biblical or spiritual song references that he knew his audience would respond to. So you can analyze um, uh, talks or presentations down to a, a really minute degree. Am I doing okay on time? Oh, I don't have to Yeah, more or less. Okay. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Dan Meyer who does some interesting stuff with teaching math. And he's got this thing he calls the three-act uh, structure for math problems. Because he, he hates the, the way textbooks present math problems. So this one example he has, and it's your typical textbook thing. And the problem is um, someone drops a coin in a well, and they calculate how long till they um, hear the splash. How deep is the well? And he's like, who cares? <laughs> I mean, why is anybody dropping coins into a well? Why do they need to know how deep it is? So what he's done is he's taken that same math problem and he's recast it into this three-act structure based upon examples from movies. So he's got these clips from, I think it's Journey to the Center of the Earth with Brendan Fraser. And I think they have to jump or something into a hole and they don't know how deep it is. So they drop the glow sticks down there. So it sets up the whole problem as sort of the exposition. Here's the problem. Here's how they figure out how to solve it. And then they actually do it. And then they actually drop the glow sticks in the well. Relevance, maybe tying to popular media, may have some value. Um, 
just one example, especially in science, I really love this One Minute Physics channel. They do these really short videos that explain physics topics in a real approachable manner. Um, it's not really necessarily insulting if you know physics, but it's engaging and gets you really interested in physics. Um, this is a fascinating video. Um, I, I almost feel like, have, have you guys seen this? No. no. All right. So this is a great example of turning the situation inside out from your expectations. Um, Troy, Michigan, uh, bad time economy. Uh, they had a tax initiative uh, trying to raise money for their library. There's a lot of things to like about this. Uh, I mean, mostly I like just the way they, they did the unexpected and they turned things around. And you could say it's a little bit devious. I mean, they did kind of pull a prank. Uh, the use of social media. Uh, when you look at the video, there's some really compelling things, and, and these are the things I like to get my students to pay attention to. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the shift in the music from the beginning, where it was kind of like melodic and, until it shifted to that more upbeat tempo. Um, graphic style. Um, but, you know, it's an example, I mean, to me, this is an effective use of storytelling techniques, not in your typical linear matter. Um, uh, what's her name? Annie Leonard, who does this, uh, How Stuff Works, does these great uh, videos. They're all animated drawings, uh, explanations. This is a great campaign uh, to try to provide some insights and issues with, with bottled water. And um, something really strange that you probably don't think of as, as a story. Um, this guy, can't see it all here, Philip Dubose. Um, he needed a job, so he, he put up his resume. He made it look exactly like an Amazon product page, where he was the product. And so everything on here behaved like Amazon. There's only one left in stock, order soon, <laughs> ships from Paris, France. Um, when you click add to cart, it popped up with a message. So he totally like immersed his story into the context of what people expect in an Amazon web page. He got a job offer from Amazon. Well, he got a lot of job offers, but he got a job offer from 
from Amazon. And that's part of the things that we teach in our DS-106 course, um, one of them being about um, sort of stories that sort of take advantage of the way the web works, not just putting stories on the web, but building things that actually live within the narrative of the web. Um, there's a, an interesting technique um, that I like to point out, like, Sometimes stories, the opening line is what makes it something that hooks you in, that grabs your interest. This is a video I found um, that just starts out, we, we found this flash drive on the side of the road, and then it plays out what happened. So these people found this drive, they wondered who it was, they looked on it and they found all these files that obviously belong to probably a middle uh, school student uh, for her uh, report on environmentalism. It had an audio track of her singing, like she was gonna record a video, and she did her song. It just so happened these people were professional musicians. So they not only wanted to find the girl who this belonged to, but they, they decided to uh, create a song for her, mixing in her audio. Uh, they tracked her down, they tracked her mom down through Facebook. I don't know how that played out. Um, they were able to give this back, and they never told them. So just imagine, you know, the girl opens this and puts it up her computer and opens up, and she's got a song that was sort of created with her voice. But that whole thing about that hook Again, a lot of times when we communicate, we give away what we're going to talk about. And there's a lot to be said to leave room for some, some gaps or what's known as partial revelation. I'm just going to skip some of this stuff. So um, I've just done a couple different um, projects where I experiment with some of these storytelling ideas. One is a, a visual storytelling exercise where you use a random images from Flickr in a different way from the Petra Flickr thing I showed. Uh, I have a site called 50 Web 2.0 Ways to Tell a Story. And it's all about these different websites that allow you to create things that don't cost any money to use, but allow you to create multimedia. And um, just in terms of media, wow, my slides. A site that I use all the time for finding my images is called Comp Fight. It allows you to search the Creative Commons um, licensed images on Flickr. I've never failed to find at least five images that I could really use for any purpose I have. And these are all stuff that you're sure have no copyright What's problem. The name of that? It's called compfight.com. I'll just go to it. I'll close with it. We'll see what comes up. Resolving host. So let's think of a topic. Let's think of a topic we need to find an image for. Gun, gunfight. Gunfight? No, no, that's the name. Oh, comp, comp fight. Oh, sorry. I thought you said gunfight. No. Um, let's say reaction. Let's say we're, we're in that still Good field. zombies. Zombies. <laughs> Zombies are easy. They're everywhere. Yeah. Now, a couple things. Um, I've already done this before, so but if you click Creative Commons, that's the only images that you see, and it, it, it'll remember that. So a lot of times, a literal search doesn't work. I mean, we got pictures of dogs. We got flames. If I'm trying to think of, a, of something to symbolize reaction, um, sometimes you have to think a little more laterally how to get something that would visually describe reaction. So you have to sort of play a little guessing game. Um, might work out with it. I might think of something like sometimes chain will bring up some metaphor that might work for it. Or maybe it's lightning. Um, but these are really um, these are really, well some of them aren't great images, but I never fail to find ones um, that look really good. I mean, this, this is a really good photograph. I mean it's professional uh, quality and you can use it for free as long as you uh, give attribution to it. And I, I use Confight on a daily basis. And then, of course, um, Jim will probably be talking a little bit more about, I think. Uh, but our digital storytelling course that I've been involved with, DS106, DS106.us, um, it's an open course. Um, you don't have to start on schedule. There's usually something going on all the time. And um, I'll just say it's the best thing on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for listening and, and participating, especially uh, Javier and Louis for actually being brave enough to put your teacher for <laughs>